Roomy Q Wizard is a free and invaluable tool for home theater calibration. But if you're not using the beta version, then you're actually missing out on features that can make things a lot better. In this video, I'll go over the key features in the beta version that I use all the time and that I just simply cannot live without anymore. And honestly, maybe you can't either. I'm just gonna dive right in here. I have Roomy Q Wizard launched here on my Mac and I'm gonna open up some of my measurements here. So I took some front left measurements. Basically, I wanna go over into the all SPL tab. So I have six total measurements here for my front left. So basically, if you think of how Odyssey or Dirac or Arc Genesis, how they have you take measurements, they basically have you take multiple measurements throughout like an area in your home theater, not just like the main listening position, they kind of have you go around it. So you have more of a bubble of great sound where they apply all the EQ and everything. And so it should all sound pretty good in there. So I kind of replicated that here. I took six different measurements and I've labeled them. So position one is my main listening position. That's where I sit and listen to everything. And then position two is slightly forward, maybe about 14, 15 inches in front. Position three is a foot to the left. And then position four is a foot in front of that. You kind of get the idea, right? It's all around this kind of bubble. So the reason I did that is I want to EQ my front left speaker, right? either using a mini DSP, graphic equalizer, doesn't matter. So in order to do that, I wanted kind of that bubble of sound like you get with those room correction softwares, right? I wanna take an average of all of those measurements that I took and then EQ that average. So instead of just EQing the front left, which is highlighted here, I'm actually EQing, basically everything here is taken into account when we average them. Typically what you wanna do is you want to go to actions and then you want to go to vector average. Now this may be slightly different on PC. If memory serves, what the actions and controls are combined into one button on the Mac, it's too different. Don't quote me on that. If we vector averages right now, we can see that, mm, yeah, something's going on here. So the vector average is really low, especially as we get into kind of like the low mid to the higher frequencies. So also if you notice up top here, I have these little uh, tabs. I get questions occasionally of like how you turn those on. If you just click on the controls tab and then go to show frequency bands, I think these are off by default. Just click that. You now have this kind of quick cheat sheet, so to speak, of what frequencies are what. So it's nice to know just off the top of your head, okay, anything below 60 hertz is considered sub bass. Anything between, you know, 60 to, what was it like 250 is bass. So you can kind of quickly point to like, hey, I'm having a problem in the low mids or the mids. So as we can see here though, if we actually, uh, let me clear the selections and just select the vector average. We actually have an issue where once we get to kind of the low mid area, which is eh, about 250, 250 Hertz, maybe a little bit before then, we have this huge drop off in output. Why is this happening? Well, if you remember, I said I took multiple measurements at different positions. And so that changes the distance of the microphone and the speaker. Basically, when we average all of these, it's not taking that distance into account. What that means is we need to fix that because if we were to try to EQ this, this response here, we're gonna have a really hard time because basically what's happened here is because of the difference in time between each measurement at each different position, it's canceling frequencies out or it's causing differences with the phasing and just a whole heap of issues, not just phasing, it's, it's a bunch of different things. So we can actually see this though. If we go into our overlays and we go over to our impulse graph, let me kind of bring this over here so you could see it. Typically uh, by default, it's gonna be set to DBFS. So if you switch this over to percentage, you should be able to see, uh, basically this is our impulse response of each speaker. Let me untick vector average, so we don't have that in there. Actually, just select the front left. So here's our baseline, right? That we want everything, that everything kind of should be. This is our, where we sit, this is our main impulse response for our front left. We zoom in, if I turn on that second, you'll notice, okay, now the green one, that's the one that's like a, the 15 inches in front of position one, it is not arriving at the same time as position one. Now if we add position three, same thing again, position four, kind of closer to position three, but as we go through all of them, we could see that we have a massive difference in terms of when things are arriving and when things aren't. And you know, it's gonna look kind of weird. So 
In the past, what we've had to do in order to kind of mitigate this is we had to select each measurement that we want to kind of align with an impulse response together. And then we would essentially select the front left as our base, right? That's the one that we want to align everything to. We would click on actions and then we click on time align. And basically what that would do is it would move that alignment of the second one or the impulse response to match the first one. So if we actually do that, and then we go and look at our impulse response again, now you can see if we clear these two, remember they were, they were off before and now look, they're right on top of each other. So these two are aligned. Perfect, right? Problem is you now have to do that for every single measurement. And if you factor in that this is just the front left with six different positions, Right? If we did more, we'd have even more that we'd have to do. If we do all of our speakers, say you got, you know, seven speakers and then six overhead speakers. Okay, that's seven plus six, which is 13. Now you have to do that for each of the 13 speakers, however many measurements you did. That's a lot of work. But now with the addition of cross correlation alignment, that's much, much easier. So what we can do here is as long as the front left is selected or whatever base measurement you want is selected, let's make sure all the other ones are selected here as well. We do wanna make sure that vector average was not selected. That is not selected, perfect. If we click on cross correlation align, now if we go back to our overlays and we kind of zoom out a little bit, turn on all the other measurements, you can see that it is aligned all of the measurements for us. So essentially this is pretty much as good as it gets. Like you don't have to do any of that manual stuff before going into time align each different one. You can just click one button and you're done. What's great is if we just do our vector average again, we can see that the vector average is much more representative <laughs> of what we actually get. And if we take a look between the two, the purple one here highlighted is our old one. And then the kind of blue one here, which is highlighted is the new one. That is actually what we're getting because all of the positions are aligned now. So if you're going to apply EQ to this one, bam, you're, you're much better off. This is actually a more accurate representation anyway of what things are gonna sound like to your ears. If you're gonna try to EQ stuff, trying to EQ like this, I mean, that's a massive difference, right? Um, we're talking about a 10 dB difference in some places. It's a pretty awesome thing. That's honestly one of the best features that I use um, I also use it for subwoofers and things like that. So I think that's a good kind of segue into doing subwoofer stuff. What I will uh, touch on real quick though, is if we go up to the EQ and you want to maybe have a target curve, I have a nice target curve already set up. Um, I'll go over this on how to set this up in my manual calibration video. But if you want just a uh, the target curve in your Room EQ Wizard window, all you have to do is once you have it set up, just go into your EQ and click on generate measurement from target shape. What that will do is it'll actually put in this target shape here, which we can then drag over here and just label this whatever we want. Target 75 dB slope, bam. So now we always have our target curve. We always know where our speakers lie before and after EQ right from a visual standpoint. This isn't something that's just on the beta version. This is on the official release as well, but just a little extra tip there for you guys. It's something I use all the time. All right, so let me close that out. So this time I'll open up subwoofer measurements so we can actually see another feature that I use. So here I have my four different sub measurements and basically these have only been level matched with each other. I haven't applied any EQ or done any time alignment or anything like that. So we have front right, front left, back left and back right subs. So if we were to go to align these two, just like before, if you follow my guide, we click on actions, go to alignment tool, and here we go. Let me uh, change this uh, setting here so we can kind of see everything that's going on behind here. So before we have some uh, adjustments here that we can make, actually what's in the beta now, it may be in the official release by the time this video comes out, is we have a fine delay adjustment. So we can have just 0 0.01 increments and really dial that in. I think that's super cool. I honestly just think that we just need the fine delay adjustment. We don't need the, the full delay. So if you try to time align these two subs here, you know, we could either go, okay, well, we can, we can kind of look here and see, no, that's not working. So maybe let's try to invert the polar, in, invert, invert the polarity, uh, you know, all that stuff. Uh, okay, I don't know. 
So actually what's here now in the beta release is impulse alignment. And this is pretty awesome. So bringing that up, if you don't see this little window down here, um, just make sure show impulse responses are ticked. We can actually go ahead and move this and see a real time result of the impulse alignment change. That's really, really awesome because we no longer have to guess anymore. You know, is this going to be the best? Like if we do this, okay, maybe my frequency response is good, but they're not actually aligned. What we can do is make sure that these are right on top of each other. As you can see, my front left and front right subs are pretty much equidistant from the mic, from my main listening position. So no additional impulse alignment is needed or any additional alignment is needed here. So we can just go ahead and click on align sum. And then what we'll do is go ahead and bring up uh, the align sum here. And now we wanna add the back left, right? Now, obviously if you're doing this for real, you know, you'd wanna measure these all first. You can also do multiple measure measurements, use cross correlation align, average those, and then use the average to do all of this as well. That's typically how I do it. That's something I will cover in my update of mini DSP tutorial series. So we're adding the back left sub. And what's great is we actually see also, oh look, we might need to invault, invault? I keep saying invault. We might need to invert the polarity here because if we look at the impulse response here, it's opposite. So if you're ever wondering, do I need to invert the polarity? Well, guess what? Now you know for a fact that in inverting the polarity here is the correct choice. If we take a look at just without it inverted and with it, we get all of this base back and everything here. It takes the guesswork out of it. If we do that, we'll go back to our second align sum. So I, I clicked on align sum there if you saw, and now we're gonna add the back right. So this one's a little funky. These are not spaced ideally. So we might wanna play around with this one, but the great thing is we can kind of see in real time, okay, what happens if we invert the polarity and try to get things squared away, you can see that no matter what we do, because of the positioning of this sub within my room, even if we invert the polarity, it's kind of off, right? Like it's, maybe that's the best we can get there. The one thing I did wanna mention that I maybe forgot to, as long as you use a acoustic timing reference on these, when you go to do the align sum and then you input these numbers into the mini DSP or whatever you're using. You can't do negative numbers in the delay. That would be incorrect. When you do the align sum, that's pretty much what you're gonna get. It's not like a best case scenario, you know, like when you run Odyssey or something like that, and it gives, kind of gives you a readout at the end of like, here was your front left before, and here is your front left after. Yeah, that front left after is normally like a best case scenario because it doesn't remeasure the changes that have been made. This will actually be pretty accurate down to maybe, there will be some slight variations here and there. That's something you can't control. But for the most part, the measurements you get from the align sum are pretty much uh, spot on. And you can verify that just by doing measurements of the align sum subs after you put them, you know, put the stuff in. And you can see here, we've delayed, you know, the back left sub by 3.92 and it was inverted. So if we were to do all of that and then measure it, measure the basically front right, front left and back left subs with that input into the back left sub on the mini DSP, this is the output that we're pretty much gonna get. And that's been my experience uh, every single time. Lastly, what I'll touch on real quick is something that I think is pretty cool. And that is the EQ filters and how they've been laid out. In the past, these EQ filters have been laid out vertically. So it's a little kind of harder to read, but now they're horizontally. So if you're trying to do something like use a graphic equalizer in your Denon and Marantz, basically do calibration that way, something I will cover in my full manual calibration tutorial that I am also working on right now. You can just take these numbers, input those into your dead on Marantz and you're good to go. It's a little easier to read this way. You can see everything you need to see right here. Whereas like before it kind of used a drop down menu. And yeah, it was kind of just a little more cumbersome. It took a little more time, not a huge change, but a welcome one nonetheless. Download the beta, try it out. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. I'd really love your thoughts. If you've been using it for a while, and you've either, either noticed some issues or you've noticed basically there are no issues. It's all just benefit after benefit. Let me know too, because you know, I think it's a really great free resource that you have. Obviously you need a measurement mic, but other than that, like it is just an invaluable priceless tool in, in my opinion for doing home theater calibrations, car audio stuff, just in general, it's really awesome. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it helpful at all, feel free to hit that like button. Also leave a comment down below, let me know 
Let me know if you're excited about the updated mini DSP tutorial series. I know many of you are. I am working on it. I promise it is coming. Hopefully I'll have it out before the holidays. Things just are a little bit crazy right now with uh, freelance work on the side and stuff. So thank you so much guys for, for checking this video out. Hope you have a good day and I'll catch you in the next video.